This took a bit of a dark turn. Hey everybody, welcome to Mainly Movies. As part of my 007 video series, today I'm going to be ranking the Timothy Dalton Bond films. If you're new here, please consider subscribing for a variety of movie related content like reviews, rank lists, and trailer reactions. So what is a rankography exactly? Well, it's my ranking of a filmography, whether that be a director's output, an actor's appearances, or even an entire franchise. My rankographies are based on personal preference, and I rank movies according to how much I enjoyed them rather than any specific technical merit or attribute. Remember, this is just my ranking, not the ranking, so be sure to post your own personal ranking of the Dalton era Bond films in the comments below. When Timothy Dalton came onto the Bond scene in 1987, we had already experienced 25 years of the franchise, 25 years of cool charm, 25 years of subtle espionage with huge doses of goofiness. And in that time, we had seen three different actors in the 007 role, each bringing their own unique spin to the same basic character. Timothy Dalton's arrival changed that, and instead of the generally suave, lighthearted Bond of the previous two and a half decades, we got a darker, action-oriented Bond, who much more closely resembled the James Bond in Ian Fleming's novels than any of the previous film incarnations. That character change also brought a tonal change, making Dalton's films the darkest and most consistent in the franchise up to that point. I've already reviewed both of the Timothy Dalton era Bond movies, so if you want to check those out for some more in-depth thoughts on each of them, I'll put the links in the description below. I'll also link them up in the cards as we go along. Alright, let's get this rankography started. Coming in at number two, The Living Daylights. So I gotta say, it was really tough to pick between these two films. As a pair, they're probably the most consistent and appropriately consecutive movies in the whole franchise, which makes choosing between them a surprisingly difficult task. I gave them the same exact rating, and they're both really good Bond movies in my eyes. The Living Daylights acts not only as our introduction to Dalton, but also to the new, dark, action-oriented approach to Bond movies. Both of these could have been extremely jarring shifts, but this film was crafted in such a way that you get on board with these changes very quickly, and this movie perfectly sets up for its successor. The thing that really hinders this movie for me, though, is its plot. I like the idea of the story it's trying to tell, but it's just so unnecessarily complex and convoluted. There are too many moving parts within the villain scheme here, and really, there are too many villains. It's this whole series of exchanges and bartering between the bad guys. We've got weapons and drugs and political figures all being moved around amid both the Cold War and the Soviet-Afghan War. It's interesting, but it all just kind of feels like you're watching a three-cup shell game that you can't quite keep track of, so no matter which cup you pick, you don't find what you're expecting. It doesn't ruin the movie for me or anything, but it does always prevent me from getting fully invested in the plot. So that means my number one Dalton-era Bond film is License to Kill. Bet you didn't see that one coming. Like I said, it was very difficult to pick between these two, and without the setup from The Living Daylights, I don't think this movie would have worked nearly as well. One of the things I appreciate most about this film, especially when compared to its predecessor, was how simple and fairly straightforward the plot was. This is a revenge story, and we finally get to see a side of Bond that we've gotten little hints of in previous movies, but have never seen in its full form. Without the oversight of MI6, the gloves are off, and it's really compelling seeing Bond as a rogue agent. When viewing this film as a standalone thing, the whole revenge plotline seems a little sudden and kinda out of character for Bond, but this movie is greatly improved by briefly veering out of the Dalton era a bit and watching Honor Majesty's Secret Service first. That movie provides some really relevant and important context that enhance what's going on here, and I just wish that they had made those connections more explicit. Either way, this is a really exciting story that's far darker than anything we had gotten in the franchise up to that point. Timothy Dalton isn't exactly my favorite Bond, but there's no denying that he could pull off the grittier tone of the movies in this era. All right, so that's my rankography of the Dalton era Bond films. Two movies, a darker tonal shift, and a whole lot more action. What does your ranking look like? I'd love to see some reasoning for your order, so be sure to post it in the comments below. Remember, I've already reviewed these movies, so you can check those videos out if you want some more in-depth discussion of each, as well as my ratings, pros and cons, and even tailored film recommendations. And if you're interested in buying any of these movies, 
I do have affiliate links to all of them in the description below. I do get a small commission from anything you buy using one of my links, so I'd really appreciate it if you'd use them if you're in the market for any of these movies. All right, so if you get some enjoyment, insight, or information out of this rankography, I'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button. And if you haven't done so already, please hit subscribe to add it so you can see more rankographies like this, as well as movie reviews. Till next time, this has been Alyssa with Mainly Movies. The way life should be.